hypothesis um, that I've been working on for, well, let's say, the past uh, 15 years now, something you can call discrete or periodic or uh, rhythmic perception. And over the years, we have gathered quite a bit of experimental evidence um, for this, um, again, in the domain of visual perception. Um, and so I'm going to show you some of this experimental evidence. Uh, first, this uh, illusion called the wagon wheel illusion, which is based on an, uh, a phenomenon termed aliasing. Aliasing is something that happens in any system that samples information discreetly, uh, and it actually happens in the visual system. But in fact, in the interest of saving time, I decided that I'm not going to uh, present this to you today, but I decided to leave the slides in just to make you feel like you're missing out on something very important. But I will tell you about uh, another series of uh, EEG experiments in which we directly tested this idea. Uh, and, and so we found that in a variety of visual tasks, the exact phase at which you present a, a visual stimulus is actually playing a big role in, the, uh, in determining the perceptual outcome. Um, and then I will tell you that alpha oscillations around 10 hertz echo or reverberate sensory information every 100 milliseconds or so uh, for many cycles. Uh, and so the reason why I'm talking about uh, these experiments in visual perception is to give you a little bit of a background uh, for how we, uh, we try to address the, the same questions in the domain of aud audition. Uh, so try to determine something like this, because we know that in audition, uh, and in particular in speech perception, but not only, uh, brain rhythms also play an important role, right? That's why we're all here. And so we thought that by exactly the same logic, these brain rhythms should create perceptual cycles that we should be able to map in audition with exactly these uh, methods. And we tried our hand at these diff applying these different methods in the auditory domain. Uh, and you will see that this was uh, largely unsuccessful. And we'll discuss at the end uh, maybe why this happened. All right, so let's start with these uh, experimental paradigms. I told you that I'm not going to talk about this wonderful wagon wheel illusion, uh, which happens in the visual system. Uh, and we mapped exactly the frequency at which it happens, and its brain correlates, and so on. But, as I said, I'm not going to tell you about. You can always ask me afterwards, of course. Uh, so let's move on to uh, this uh, other very important paradigm that we've been using. Um, it's, the, it's based on the very simple idea that I, would, that I was describing at the beginning. So um, if you assume that a particular perceptual function depends on an oscillatory implementation, then there should be preferred phases of the cycle at which this function should be favored, and other phases at which the same function should be inhibited. And now the exact perceptual function that we're talking about here could be anything, of course. It could be uh, the conscious detection of a stimulus, as illustrated here, but it could also be uh, attention, it could be uh, saccadic responses, it could be uh, motor decisions. And in fact, each of these people here was responsible for running a, a different version of this paradigm where we tested the influence of ongoing EEG phase on different uh, perceptual outcomes in, in a different task. So I won't present them all in detail, of course, but let me tell you about the first version of this paradigm that we published in uh, 2009. So this is really the simplest test that you can imagine. Uh, we present a stimulus on every trial, but at threshold, so that half of the time people detect it, and half the time they don't, right? So in practice, it looked like this. The subjects were fixating at the center of the screen, but they were paying covert attention to these placeholders, marking the location where they should expect the target. And then at a random and totally unpredictable moment, we would just flash the target at this location. And for you, it's easy to see. But in the experiment, the luminance of this target was adjusted um, with a staircase procedure so that, on average, people would detect only half of those uh, targets, so that's the hit trials, and they would totally miss the other half, so that's the misses. Um, and so we we're exactly in this situation, and now we're in a position to ask, does this uh, perceptual outcome, the hit or miss, uh, depend on the phase of ongoing oscillations? And that's exactly what I'm showing here. So. Uh, here, we're voluntarily focusing on pre-stimulus time points, just to be sure that we're only looking at ongoing spontaneous oscillations, and not oscillations that might be triggered or entrained, if you want, by the uh, onset of the stimulus, right? So for every pre-stimulus time point, and for every oscillatory frequency here between 2 and uh, 50 hertz, what I'm showing here is the phase opposition between hits and misses. That is, how different are the uh, distributions of phases for these two groups of trials. And uh, using permutation statistics, we can get a p-value uh, 
for this phase opposition, and of course we can correct it for multiple comparisons across all time points, frequencies, and uh, electrodes. And what you see here is that there is indeed a region, a period, roughly in the last couple hundred milliseconds before stimulus onset, and in frequency uh, around 7 hertz, so in the theta range, there is a, a region here where uh, the phases do differ for hits and for misses, right? Uh, and this, by the way, is a scalp topography. It's a view from the top, and it tells you that these effects are produced over frontal cent central electrodes. So uh, I've told you that we've played more or less the same game with uh, many different tasks. Now I think we have uh, 10 different experiments that are published uh, with um, exactly this, uh, this method, but applied to a different visual task. And I thought rather than presenting them all in detail, because I don't have time, what I can do is throw all these results together and do a sort of meta-analysis of all the different results uh, that we've obtained with this paradigm. So by doing this, of course, I'm putting together apples and oranges because these tasks are very different. Uh, but on the other hand, they have something in common, and that's all that should matter for now. What they have in common is that they're all visual tasks, so at time zero I'm always going to show visual stimulus, and um, uh, the stimulus is always unpredictable to the subject, uh, and so we're always looking at the influence of truly spontaneous ongoing oscillations on subsequent visual perception. And so that's what we get when we put all of this data together. Note the uh, p-values here that are very significant, of course, because of the, the number of uh, subjects and data points in this uh, analysis. So what you see here is that roughly in the last uh, 400 milliseconds before the stimulus onset, there is uh, this sort of significant uh, phase opposition. It looks a bit like there are two separate moments at which this is significant, but this is very misleading. Of course, look at the p-values here. In fact, this is very significant throughout the entire uh, pre-stimulus period, or at least the entire, uh, the, the last 400 milliseconds. Uh, what's more interesting is maybe to focus on the uh, frequency distribution of these effects, right? Uh, so we have, most of these effects are roughly between 5 and 15 hertz, very restricted in, uh, in frequency, and there seem to be two separate peaks in this uh, distribution, one around 7 hertz in the theta band and one around 10, 11 hertz in the, um, in the alpha band. And uh, although that's really speculation at this point, I think in the data set, when you look hard enough, at least you can see that these uh, 7 hertz effects tend to be produced more over frontal regions and tend to involve higher level attentional tasks, whereas the, uh, the alpha uh, effects tend to be produ produced more over occipital regions and involve maybe simpler visual detection tasks, right? But we might need uh, something more like 100 studies to, uh, to be sure about this conclusion. Uh, in any case, the, the point I really want to make with this slide is that basically for a, a great number of visual tasks, 10 different tasks now, the, uh, what we find is that um, there is a succession of uh, good and bad phases in the ongoing EEG, right? That's really what this means. And so what, what it means is that these tasks, they operate not continuously over time, but actually rhythmically, uh, periodically, uh, as a sequence of uh, cycles with well-defined on and off phases. And so that's why when I describe these results, I like to talk about perceptual cycles, because to me that's the, the conclusion here. Okay, let me tell you about the last paradigm I wanted to mention. The question we wanted to ask here is um, can these perceptual cycles be measured just before the stimulus onset, like I was showing just before, or could we also see these cycles or a signature of these cycles after stimulus onset, during sensory processing? And the problem is after stimulus onset, we can't just compare phases because there is a strong reset due to the stimulus onset uh, caused by the visual evoked potential, and all the phases look more or less the same, right? So we have to find a new method for this. And the second question we wanted to ask is, if the answer to the first is yes, of course, then uh, how many successive cycles would be found to encode a given visual event? So suppose you present an event at time zero. Is this visual event, this flash, for example, be encoded only in the next available cycle and then forgotten? Or is the brain going to carry over some memory of this information from cycle to cycle? And if so, then for how many cycles? And to uh, answer these two questions, what we did is uh, we presented to our subjects very long and uh, boring sequences of luminance values. 
while we recorded their EEG, and then we performed a simple uh, linear cross-correlation between these two signals to derive the average uh, brain response function. Or I guess this is the same method that Pascal was mentioning this morning in the context of the transfer function. So you can think of it also as the transfer function of the visual system. Uh, so let me show you the stimulus to make it a bit more concrete. Of course, it's downsampled here, but you can imagine that the luminance of this disk was changed on every refresh of the screen to a new random value with a refresh rate of uh, 160 hertz. So this sequence had equal power. It was white noise with equal power at all frequencies between 0 and 80 hertz. And there was a task just to keep the subjects interested. They had to detect the occurrence of a square inside the disk. Um, but actually, we really didn't care about the subject's performance here. What we just wanted to do was to cross-correlate all of the fluctuations of luminance in this disk with the concurrently recorded EEG. And so by doing so, we would find out what is the average filter that the brain is applying to its uh, input, which mathematically is also called the impulse response function. So let me show you two examples of uh, impulse response functions from two subjects, representative S1, S2. Um, I want to be clear about what I'm showing here, because to some people, these might look like eventuated potentials, but they're not eventuated potentials. We're not looking at voltage as a function of time. We're looking here at uh, correlation in units of R as a function of the delay or the lag at which you look at the EEG relative to the stimulus sequence. So, for example, the proper way to read the speak here is that there is a good correlation between the stimulus presented at time t and the EEG recorded at time t plus uh, 350 milliseconds. This correlation actually reverses at the lag of 400 milliseconds, but it comes back again at 450 and then 550 and 650 milliseconds. So what we see in these, uh, in these impulse response functions, and this was rather surprising to us, is that there are fa fairly large and fairly long-lasting oscillations sometimes up to lags even beyond one second. Uh, and you can see in, in these power spectra, and I guess this would correspond to the, the transfer function that Pascal was showing this morning, you can see that these are very uh, strongly locked to uh, the alpha frequency band, right around uh, 10 hertz. And this was true, of course, not just for these two subjects, but for every subject in the group of uh, eight that participated in this version of the experiment. Um, and these effects were strongest over uh, occipital electrodes. Now, some of you might think, well, we know that occipital electrodes produce a lot of alpha oscillations. That's the, that's the alpha rhythm. So maybe this is all a mathematical artifact. Maybe whenever I cross-correlate a white noise sequence with a 10 hertz oscillation, maybe mathematically I should always expect to see uh, 10 hertz oscillations in my impulse response function. But if this was true, then you would get exactly the same oscillation when you cross-correlate the stimulus from one trial with the EEG from a different trial, because they have exactly the same uh, statistical structure. Uh, and as you can see in the red line, that's, that's not happening, right? So it's not enough to have, on the one hand, a white noise stimulus sequence, and on the other hand, an alpha oscillation. If you just cross-correlate the two, you'll get the red line. What you need is for this alpha oscillation to somehow lock to or respond to the particular stimulus sequence that you're showing on this trial. So in this instance, at least the alpha that we're looking at is a true response to the stimulus. So going back to the original question, when does the EEG carry information about the, the visual stimulus? Well, what we see and what was surprising to us is that it's not just at two or three early moments that, that would correspond to the, the, the peaks and troughs of classic eventuated potentials, but in fact, at many periodically recurring delays, right? At 600 and 700 and 800 and 900 milliseconds. And what this means, in other words, is that all of the little fluctuations in the input sequence are being replayed or echoed or reverberated in the brain um, every 100 milliseconds and up to very long lags beyond one second. And to us, that was another clear evidence for a periodicity in perception, this time at 10 hertz. But this time also, these perceptual cycles are measured not before stimulus onset, but during sensory processing, right? While the luminance sequence is on the screen. And so that answers the, the first question. And to answer the second question, what we see is that each visual event in our luminance sequence appeared to be encoded not just in one, but in several successive uh, cycles. And I would argue that this might be a very good way for your brain to stitch together uh, a continuous perceptual experience from a series of uh, discrete snapshots or discrete uh, cycles simply by carrying over information from uh, cycle to cycle or a memory of information from cycle to cycle.
All right, so let me conclude about vision before we can move on to audition. What I've told you is that many people believe that brain rhythms serve a role in visual perception. And what we have argued is that there has to be a flip side to this coin. And, and the flip side is that oscillation should then have perceptual consequences, even at the very rapid time scale of the oscillatory cycle itself. So some consequences include perceptual aliasing, what I call the perceptual cycles, a succession of good and bad phases in the ongoing EEG. Uh, and just now, uh, you've seen perceptual echoes, a reverberation of sensory information around uh, 10 hertz. Now, what we thought at this point is that we can apply exactly the same logic to audition, right? Because we know that brain rhythms serve a role in auditory perception, in particular in, in speech perception, but not only. So if we apply exactly the same logic, then we should be able to find um, uh, similar uh, perceptual cycles in the auditory domain. And so that's what we try to do, simply to apply these three paradigms to the auditory domain and see what we get. Uh, and I, yes, so by exactly the same logic, we should get these perceptual cycles. I want to mention uh, that uh, most of this work was done as part of the PhD uh, thesis of uh, Benedict Zufel, who's here in the audience somewhere. Um, and we published a lot of these results, at least in a preliminary form, in a, in a review paper in 2014. Okay, so first we tried to get an auditory version of the wagon wheel illusion, but because I didn't present the visual version, I'm not going to tell you about the auditory version, even though it's very interesting. You can always ask me about it later. Uh, so moving on to the other paradigm. So by the way, the answer is no, we cannot create uh, an auditory version of the wagon wheel illusion. Um, so let's move on to the other paradigm. Can we find um, a relation between the ongoing EEG phase and the perception of an auditory stimulus? So you remember that in vision, uh, we were able to find this uh, phase dependence of visual perception. So for a simple flash on a black background presented at an unpredictable time, there was uh, a phase here that could predict whether you're going to see the flash or not. So can we get exactly the same thing in the auditory domain? If I present a click on a silent background, the click is at threshold. You're going to detect it only half the time and you're not going to hear it the other half of the time. Is there uh, a phase value before the stimulus onset that can predict whether you see it or not? And the answer here appears to be no. Uh, and we did this over 21 subjects. Each subject saw more than 1,000 trials. So there was really no issue of statistical power here. There's really absolutely nothing before the stimulus onset to tell you whether you're going to see the, the stimulus or not. Right. So the answer here is no, at least under these conditions, when you're looking at simple clicks at threshold on a silent background, there doesn't seem to be an influence of ongoing oscillations on your detection of the stimulus. I want to mention that uh, a similar conclusion was reached independently by uh, Zofel and Heil in 2013. Um, and I know that there are some people who have found uh, a phase dependence of auditory perception, but always using different paradigms. And there might be something to it that we can discuss uh, at the end. All right, so let's move on to the other paradigm, the perceptual echoes. Can we at least find uh, perceptual echoes in audition? So to test this, well, we took a different group of subjects and we tried to map on exactly the, sub the same subject so that things would be comparable, uh, the uh, visual impulse response function and the auditory impulse response function. We used exactly the same white noise sequences in both cases. I mean, they were different on different trials, but exactly the same sequences were presented uh, for both the visual and the auditory domain. In the visual domain, you remember, these white noise sequences are modulating the luminance of a disk that is presented in the periphery. In the auditory domain, the exact same white noise sequences are, are used to modulate the loudness of a pure tone carrier at a, a thousand hertz. Um, and there was also a task, but I'm not going to mention the task because it's not really important here, right? So now we can ask what happens to the impulse response functions. And this is what happens. In black, you have the visual impulse response function. In red, the auditory impulse response function. These are, again, two representative subjects. And this is a grand average over, I think, 10 subjects in this experiment. Um, and in vision, we find, again, our nice alpha oscillations. Uh, but in audition, Besides an early eventuated potential, there doesn't seem to be anything really long-lasting, anything that could compare to our perceptual echo. This becomes more visible if I go to the time frequency domain. In both the visual and the uh, auditory cases, you see a, a very clear uh, broadband transient at uh, early lags. But in the visual case, this is followed by a long tail, specifically around 10 hertz, and there's nothing long-lasting at all in the uh, auditory case. So here again, the conclusion appears to be no. Uh, 
So I think it's time to pause a little bit and try to wonder why. Um, why do we fail to replicate, in addition, these periodic signatures that appeared so easy to find in vision? Uh, and so I'm going to probably say things here that might appear very trivial to many of you, uh, but they weren't trivial to us because probably we were coming from a different field uh, and we had a, a very different approach at the time. So what we reasoned is that well, you know, maybe it was a silly idea after all, because the visual and the auditory systems are very different. I think we all agree on this. Um, they are different because they have to process different types of inputs. Ecologically, they have to perform different functions, and they have to extract different types of information from uh, their sensory inputs. And in particular, temporal information is a lot more important for audition than it is for vision. And in fact, in vision, you could even afford to do rhythmic sampling totally blindly. And what I mean by it, blindly is totally independent of your inputs. You can take your snapshots and apply them at arbitrary times, and you're not going to lose any important information. Whereas, of course, in audition, that would be dramatic. If you try to do this in audition, you might put your good phase at the wrong time and your bad phase at the time where the information is important, and you will miss everything, right? So this was our intuition. Uh, but we wanted to go beyond just an intuition and to actually demonstrate it. So we did this very simple, silly experiment uh, in which we compared um, the robustness of the visual and the auditory system to downsampling of the inputs. Right? So we did the downsampling. Right? This is nothing about oscillations. or uh, So we, took, uh, we tried to take as similar stimuli that were as similar as possible in the two domains. So there were 2.5 snippets uh, of a person telling a story. And in the visual domain, this story was told using sign language, because it had to be visual inputs, so it was just a video. Uh, and in the auditory domain, the story was told with just plain words, right? Um, and uh, what we did then is we simply took the, out the, the, the video, for example, and downsampled it to different extents, subsampled it to different extents, and s tried to see how robust the system would be to this, uh, this downsampling. So let me show you an example. In the uh, visual domain, uh, this is actually not downsampled. This is the uh, initial uh, sampling rate of, I think, 16 hertz for these videos. And of course, then you can see that the motion is very smooth. And uh, you know, unless you speak sign language, then you would not understand what they say. But at least you can recognize the movements. If I take the same video and I downsample it, I think in this case, to uh, 3 hertz, what you will see is that, of course, the movement is jittered but you actually haven't lost anything uh, from the original movement, right? You can still tell exactly what movement is being done. And that's what the curves also tell us. Uh, basically, down to 2, 3 hertz, the performance remains fairly good. And you really have to downsample your inputs very strongly down to 1 or maybe half a hertz to actually have a cost in performance, right? And that's not the case, of course, for audition. Uh, so if I take my... Uh, um, my speech snippets, uh, and so we did this for audition. We went to the wavelet domain as a sort of crude representation of what might happen in the cochlea, uh, and then we downsampled our wavelets to different extents before doing the inverse wavelet transform and going back to the uh, original waveform. So if I play uh, something downsampled at 1,000 hertz here, at half past 12 the next day, Lord Henry Watton, Charlton Curzon. So it sounds a bit artificial, but you have no problem following the sentence. If I take exactly the same thing, and that's the corresponding spectrogram, and, and, and I downsample it to 16 hertz, so that's the equivalent of the, the first movie that you saw. Now, All right, so it's really difficult to understand this, and the performance shows exactly this. It's really difficult to follow wh what is being said, right? Uh, so, of course, you might think, well, that's because I used uh, a very simple, not a, a very elaborate uh, representation for my um, audio inputs, the wavelet representation. Um, and we might get something more robust if we start up from a more elaborate representation. And, and we followed exactly this, uh, this line of reasoning in a follow-up study. Uh, where we, uh, for a different group of subjects, we used two different ways of downsampling the auditory inputs. We did again our wavelet downsampling, so this uh, black curve here would actually correspond to this, uh, the same black curve there. Uh, but we also did uh, vocoding of the inputs instead of the, the wavelet transform. So we did vocoding to extract auditory features, and we downsampled the vocoded features before going back to the original waveforms, right? And when you do this, I'm playing 16 hertz again, but now from, uh, based on the vocoded features. When you do this... His principles were out of date, but there was a good deal to be said for his prejudices. 
So again, it's a bit artificial, but I hope it's clear for everyone that now you can understand something of the sentence, whereas it wasn't possible uh, based on the wavelet domain only. So yeah, I want to point out that, of course, none of these results directly demonstrates the existence of rhythmic sampling, neither in vision nor in audition. Right? What we're doing here is just looking at boundary conditions for this sampling to occur. And so what we learn, for example, is that in audition, if rhythmic sampling were to exist, then it probably would have to exist at a rather late processing stage, after all the uh, rapid temporal features of the inputs have been extracted. So for example, uh, looking at vocoded features rather than at, at simple uh, wavelet uh, features. And so if it is true, then it means that we should have been testing our visual paradigms, our auditory wagon wheel, our, our perceptual cycles, our perceptual echoes paradigm, not with very simple low-level uh, auditory stimuli, but with rather high-level stimuli, maybe speech or, or language stimuli. And that's actually something that uh, we've been trying to do, uh, unfortunately not with much success either, but that's a different story. Um, I invite you to go see the poster of uh, Benedict Zöffel this afternoon, who will present our efforts to look at perceptual echoes with uh, speech stimuli. Now, I want to point out uh, that there is another possibility here, not necessarily exclusive, um, but we realize that what might also happen in, uh, in audition is that you might not do this uh, blind sampling like we're, like we're doing in vision, um, but you're, you're sampling because that would totally destroy all, all the auditory, the important temporal information, as I explained, but maybe you're doing your sampling in a more uh, intelligent way, in a stimulus-dependent manner, taking into account the temporal structure of the uh, sensory inputs in order to avoid disrupting these important temporal features, right? And, well, that sounds very much like rhythmic entrainment, right? Originally, we didn't want to consider this because we thought that entrainment is a different beast altogether compared to uh, rhythmic sampling. But a posteriori, we realize, well, maybe rhythmic entrainment is actually nothing more than rhythmic sampling but just a smart version of it, a version of it that actually takes into account the input in order to not destroy it, right? So that's why we started getting interested in, in, uh, in speech entrainment. Uh, and um, like everyone else here, uh, that's the debate that we had yesterday and, and this morning a little bit, uh, we were worried, of course, uh, because you know, if you define speech entrainment as uh, basically a phase alignment between brain signals and, and stimulus signals, well, uh, you know what you would, yeah, no problem. What you would want to, uh, what you would want to conclude is that the uh, the brain signals are actively processing the important uh, parts uh, of your inputs, right? But there's always another explanation. The other explanation is that your brain signals are just passively responding to the rhythmic structure in your in your sensory inputs, right? And it's really hard to get around this problem. In other words, can we prove that entrainment would occur if the inputs were not trivially rhythmic? And uh, that's the problem that we tried to tackle together with, with Benedict in a series of papers. We had a, a psychophysical paper, an EEG paper, and more recently a, a paper where we look at this in, uh, in uh, monkey auditory cortex rec recordings together with uh, uh, Peter Lakatos. So uh, the reasoning that we had here was very simple. We started off from our uh, speech snippets. I can play you a, a snippet again if, if you remember. He was a hero to his valet who bullied him and a terror to most of his relations whom he bullied in turn. Okay, and so what we did from those is uh, we look at the, at the speech envelope and the speech envelope defines cycles. We extracted these cycles and we, uh, we basically normalized them in duration if you want and we stacked them up together here to find out how is the, uh, the frequency distribution across the different phases of all of these um, envelope cycles. And what you can see here, of course, it's not surprising at all, it's nearly the definition of, a, of an envelope cycle, is that there's a lot more energy at the peak of the envelope cycle than on the sides uh, of the envelope cycle, at the trough of the envelope cycles, right? So that's trivial, but that's exactly the problem that we have, because if we now present uh, an auditory target at different phases of this type of stimulus, it's not surprising that at one phase you're going to miss it because there's masking, whereas at other phases you're probably more likely to detect it, right? So perceptual entrainment here would be trivial. So how do we get around this problem? And what we did is actually very simple. We decided to inject noise, basically change these stimuli uh, to what we call constructed snippets by injecting noise at different phases, uh, so different amounts of noise 
specifically designed for the different phases of the speech envelope, just to fill in the gaps, right? And so, in the end, we injected more noise, of course, on the side than in the middle, but now the frequency distribution was exactly the same for all phases of the speech envelope. So if I have you listen to this now, what you'll hear is a lot of noise, because that's what we did to the, to the original uh, speech, but if you listen carefully, you can still hear the speech behind the noise. Right? So now we can you know, uh, show these sounds well. Have subjects listen to these sounds, and, and they can track the speech uh, signal, and then we can present targets at different phases of the speech envelope. Um, but now if there is um, phases that seem to be preferred for detection, it won't be a trivial result, because at least the frequency distribution is the same for all of these different phases, right? And so that's exactly what we did, and here is what we found. So uh, the clicks were presented at time zero. These were, again, threshold clicks. And what I'm representing here uh, for the different time points is um, the dependence of the detection of the click presented at time zero uh, on the phase of the speech envelope at different lags relative to this time, right? And so what you see here is basically something equivalent to what we saw in the visual domain. In the last couple hundred milliseconds before you present your stimulus, there is a strong phase dependence in this case of auditory perception, uh, on the phase of the, uh, the, the speech-induced uh, rhythm. Right? But now this result is not trivial anymore because the inputs are not trivially rhythmic. Okay? So I'm just going to conclude with this. Uh, in vision, we found many periodicities roughly in the range of 5 to 15 hertz. Um, and we think of these periodicities as perceptual consequences of oscillatory brain mechanisms. Um, and with the same logic, in, uh, um, in addition, oscillations are known to be very important. And so we thought that we should easily find similar signatures of rhythmic sampling, but we had some initial trouble finding these signatures. And so we learned some things along the way. We learned that if periodic sampling occurs in audition, then it probably would need to operate on higher level rather than lower level representations. And, or not exclusively, um, periodic sampling probably would need to adjust uh, its phase to the temporal structure of the input, which is actually more entrainment than sampling when you think about it. But to some people, this might be the same thing. And I want to finish with the same disclaimer. Uh, I know that a lot of you have known these things for many years, but we didn't know because we, we, we came at it from a, a totally different approach. And I think the, 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 the fact that we uh, reached similar conclusions with this different approach is also interesting by itself. So, thank you. So for the visual perceptual cycle experiment, uh, will you see the same kind of 10 hertz echo if you only flash the disk once? In other words, uh, this kind of echo depends on the property of the stimulus. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, we, we, we see these long-lasting oscillations. I think you mean the perceptual echoes, right? We see these long-lasting oscillations because we're using white noise, long white noise sequences. If you just present uh, a flash, you basically get an eventuated potential, right? And if you had long oscillations after eventuated potentials, people would have reported it before. But there's really something intriguing here, because if it's an impulse response function based on linear systems analysis, you should also have it with an impulse. And you don't have it, so there's something highly nonlinear here. But we think, you know, of course, it's my interpretation, but we think we're making the system more linear by using these white noise sequences, and the nonlinearity is appearing when you just present a flash followed by nothing. Uh, but yeah, that's an interpretation. No. Uh, how about? In isolation, and then you have to wait until the impulse response has decayed, and then you present the next impulse. So what you have recorded is a superposition of many impulse responses, and that depends strongly on the frequency at which you present the impulses, as Joachim has nicely shown. Um, and uh, what was the average frequency of the flicker of your um, impulse, there was some average frequency, right? It was not um, evenly distributed. No, no, it was evenly distributed. It, it's, <laughs> well, I promise. Uh, yeah, so it is, it is white noise, right? It stops, it stops at 80 hertz because our refresh rate is 160, right? So right. we have the Nyquist issue. But between 0 and 80, it's fully 
flat spectrum white noise, right? Uh, I, I think what you're saying. Um, there were no long mm. intervals, no long ISIs. There was never a one second ISI, which would be one hertz. No, I mean, uh, which experiment are we talking? We're talking about the white noise, the, the disc that is flashing, the, the right? The disc, and then you showed this, um, well, you called it the impulse response. Yeah. So, I mean, in linear systems, it's exactly the same. Whether you map, that's uh, the same answer that I was giving earlier, right? Whether you map this impulse response function with a single impulse or with a white noise sequence, because uh, from a linear system, you would get exactly the same, the same response in both cases, right? Um, and, you know, the fact that we don't get it proves that the system is nonlinear. Um, but to answer your question, here we use totally flat spectrum. I mean, yeah, the, the stimuli were six seconds in length, and of course, between trials, there, was, uh, there were uh, intervals, but those are not relevant, right? What we're analyzing is the six seconds during which the white noise sequence is on the screen. Um, one comment and a question. So the comment is that, as you probably know, um, in the somatosensory domain, it has also been shown, right, that uh, ongoing, actually like 14 hertz activity is modulating the detectability of stimuli. So auditory modality really seems to stick out here. And um, the question is about your last uh, study that you showed where you used the noise to basically get the power spectrum flat in mm -hmm. time. Do you think this is then a, an entrainment to the physical property because there's probably some sort of phase alignment still when you have the, the actual sound or like the voice content there? Or is it more something like ding has shown that is related to actually the internal um, detection of a speech content there. You see, the, and like, you, you do have something physical there, right? There is yes, no yes. So I would like to argue that it's the second. Uh, I, I can't be sure. What I know is that if it's, if it's um, entrainment to some physical aspects of my stimulus, it's not let's say it's, it's not the, those aspects that are encoded at the cochlea. It's not those aspects that are present in a, in a wavelet transform, for example, because those have been equalized, right? But there are still higher order statistics that the brain might pick up automatically that are not directly related to speech processing, right? So we have an EEG experiment where we can find entrainment. There's no problem. But for example, the entrainment is also there for reversed versions of these, uh, of these snippets where, you know, I mean, people hear the speech, um, the rhythm, but they can't track the, uh, the exact words that are being said, right? So, yes, the answer is probably somewhere in between. Uh, yeah, my question was actually related to uh, the one that was just asked, but uh, I was wondering, given that there's so much auditory uh, expertise in the room, um, or maybe also you can explain that, how, how can I imagine um, like any mechanism to exploit information from um, something where there's just white noise everywhere such that there's no nothing popping out anymore. So if all the gaps have been filled, what is left there uh, for, for what mechanism to pull it out again and uh, maybe in the end get a projection, something uh, uh, to use Lars's words or um, yes. use whatever information to exploit it. So there is no auditory expertise on this podium. So I think I should turn the question to uh, the rest of the audience. We'll have uh, maybe, how about an answer from Benedict and Oded to that one? They have similar, well, they have contrasting answers, but um, Benedict did this, where's Benedict? Who's the student? Since it's your study, you, answer, you give an answer, and then Oded will give his answer. No. Okay. So short, first, short and punchy answers, that goes without saying. Okay. So first, what um, Rufin didn't explain is that um, the spectral energy that you saw in, in this plot, the spectral energy as a function of envelope phase, uh, that was on average. So if you look at the actual stimulus, there are still some fluctuations left. Of course, we need fluctuations, otherwise if, if we destroy everything, then we cannot understand the stimulus anymore. So um, that's probably a, mis, a bit misleading what is shown here. So it's not that everything is completely uh, equalized. Um, and second, um, everything that we, uh, um, all that we equalize here is the, the spectral content and amplitude across um, envelope phases. So there, for instance, there, are, there is fine structure left 
there are, there, there are fast fluctuations left that might um, differ uh, between um, envelope phases. And also, um, what we could imagine is that um, uh, coherence between uh, different sound frequencies, uh, these are not equalized here. So, for instance, some frequencies, they might go up together or go down together. And we don't equalize that here. And maybe we can use that to differentiate speech and noise. And another brief answer by Odette, who has a, his own perspective and research on this. I would like to pass, David, because <laughs> I don't know how to talk in brief sentences. But well, basically, <laughs> we'll help you with that, though. But you know, just you know, maybe David refers to a, a, a work that I, you know I, I did before that says that theoretically, this is an analytic uh, result that if you take a signal that is um, an, a narrow band the envelope, if you, and you do Hilbert on it, the envelope function and the phase function, cosine phi, is related. And in cosine phi, there is an embedded information on the envelope that you try to decompose by doing this Hilbert decomposition. Now, you take this cosine phi and you run it through a narrow band filter, like the cochlear filter, Another analytic you know, result from signal information and information theory is that in the envelope of the output, you will have a regeneration of the original envelope because it was contained in the phi, in the cosine phi, in the, in the fine structure. So maybe the, the reason that you have that, it, the output at the, at the cochlea of the listener is not flat is because you have some fine structure residues. And they are regenerating the original envelope of the signal. Nevertheless, that in the time signal, in the time domain, it was seemed to be flat. Are you happy that you asked now? <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you wish for. OK, uh, maybe just a last point we want to finish. A, a, a very interesting um, spec kind of philosophical position or speculation at the end about the relationship between, or uh, your interpretation of entrainment as intelligent sampling. I mean, I think that's a, a cool and weird idea. Are we on board with that? Do we like that? Is entrainment intelligent sampling? Five stars for that. Aww. Yes, in that case, thank you. <laughs> you <were laughs>